Uh, so uh, it basically includes the, ov the overview of the model and uh, then the model assumptions that uh, Dr. Abdulaziz uh, already went through. Then we have a user guide. I believe you already have the, the fact sheet uh, that was, yeah, that came through. And it, it also includes the user guide. And uh, as, the, as Dr. Abdulaziz already uh, went through uh, the, uh, the workflow to uh, use the model, um, you just basically have to have uh, three types of data, the environmental variables, uh, you, need the, you need to enter the number of the days that you want uh, the carbon removal, and then you need the, uh, the global warming potential. Uh, here we have also included uh, the models that we have uh, included into the code, uh, just uh, the equations that we used, and then also and then also the equations that we use to upscale the uh, upscale the uh, the instantaneous measurements. And okay, so uh, in the in the example sheet, uh, this is basically the interface that uh, was already shown previously. We have included um, uh, the example data set here that we have uh, that was basically used to develop this model. Uh, I'm sorry, can everybody hear me? Yeah, oh. I thought I was one. And this is the particular sheet that we can, we are going to use, or we, uh, you can use, uh, our user can use for predicting uh, carbon fluxes. I think this, we can see everything, yeah. So for example, I'm just, For example, uh, as, uh, as was already told previously, that uh, we need at least a minimum of one set of, uh, uh, one set of data, like uh, environmental variables. Uh, so if you can input for photosynthetically active radiation of, uh, we, I, we, I just took this data from that uh, data set that we collected uh, for our BWM2 project. So these are realistic data. Um, we have, uh, for example, if we put PAR for 1427.1, that's in micromole per meter square per second. For soil temperature, we can include, oh, oh, we can see that, right? Okay, so the number is uh, 1,427, to zoom it, oh, go ahead, okay. The number is uh, 1,427.1, yeah. Can, can, you can, can you see at the back now, or, yeah? 1,427. Sorry about that. Yeah. So for soil temperature, we can include 22.2. Uh, sorry, 22.8. My apologies. Uh, for salinity, we could include 17.8. And then the second input that we can give is the number of the days that we need to calculate the NACR. Um, uh, for the region that the model has been uh, calibrated with, it could be between May to October, which, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, which accumulates to 183 days. And for the global warming potential, you can just have a drop down menu, as you can see there. You can select either 31, 34, or 86. And we recommend, we recommend uh, the value of 34. All right, so you have all the inputs now and you can just run the model. Select run, and you have the outputs here. I believe everybody has got an output here. Yes, yeah, so you can see from the first column here, uh, the predicted uh, data in net fluxes, it's minus 12.23 micromole per meter square per second. For the night time, we have 3.07 micromole, uh, micromole per meter square per second. And then the predicted methane emission, which is here 22.27. So that's just the in instantaneous one that was uh, basically uh, predicted using that equation. Um, what we did here is we upscaled this data for that particular number of days that we want the NSCR, that is 183 days, and it was upscaled to the value of uh, 
for carbon dioxide, uh, it's minus 869.53 gram carbon per meter square, and that's for that year, that's an annual, uh, annual estimate. And then for methane, it's uh, 143.64 uh, gram carbon per meter square. And then finally, the net carbon um, removal over that particular uh, period annually, it's going to be minus 725.89. So that's a lot of numbers. I'm just uh, going to show you that how it can be helpful. So let's uh, consider a scenario where um, you know that climate change increases temperature. And so let's consider of increasing uh, the soil temperature to one degree Celsius. So let's change this to 23.8. It's one degree. Yes. And then let's uh, consider increasing the salinity of the salt merge to 20 ppt. I hope everybody has got that, those numbers. And then let's run the code again. Uh, let's, okay, before running the code, let's, remem let's remember that uh, the net carbon removal was minus 725. So then I run the code. And as you can see, we got all the outputs. And basically, the last output, which is the carbon removal, it's uh, minus 736. So uh, what it shows is that with the increase of uh, one, degree Celsius of temp one degree Celsius of soil temperature and the increasing of salinity of the uh, salt marsh from 17.8 to 20, uh, it has actually increased uh, the amount of uh, carbon uh, or basically uh, the carbon storage to 10 gram per meter square. I covered so. You can write, okay. That's it? Yes. Okay. So I, I, how many minutes? Five more minutes? It's a lot of time. So, <laughs> okay, two and a half. All right, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I just wanted to play a little bit with this in front of you. If you think that your area is somewhere in North Carolina, May to October is underestimation of the growing period. Okay, so in that case, I think my microphone is on. So, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. So, if you think that 183 is basically May, June, July, August, September, October, six months, okay? So, six months, uh, cumulatively, we assumed all the days are productive. It may not be the fact, but it's like year to year, it varies. So. We said that, okay, 183 would be the growing season in this month, but if you are somewhere in, let's say, you know, South Carolina, okay, and you think that, you know what, I think my productive month would be April through November, okay, so you can change these days. Like, this is not a fixed number in the model, as you, when you will play with that, let's say somebody say that, okay, no, I'm in Florida, and this model is applicable to Florida, Let's say, let's let assume we do, do, not, do not have Florida data. So what do you do? You change it to 365, I just did it. Okay, so, and then run. Okay, and you can see that uh, you'll get a much higher number because your productive days have increased. Okay, 1467, go ahead. Uh, Cape Cod side was uh, in our uh, model, that's true. And uh, I think, you know, it's not all the Cape Cod measurements, you know, as Jim Tang in the morning, is it methane or carbon dioxide? What, what, which one are you referring to? Uh, 
you just you just probably you know you probably don't remember exactly which one right so let me go through the slides which one are you talking about then i can give a more precise answer so i had many hidden slides yeah so was it regarding this one or the cape cod model the first model i, I guess for me it's um I just wanted to know, like, because this model can be used nationwide, but if I were to, oh, no. okay, oh, sorry. Oh, not, sorry. not yet there, not yet there. Oh, Mid-Atlantic. Mid-Atlantic, yes. but if I want to use it for Massachusetts specific sites, if I, if I do that, then would I make sure to uh, note that Massachusetts sites are usually on the lower or higher end of the model predicted numbers? Uh, for methane, is on the lower end. Oh. For methane, for carbon dioxide, this is kind of mixed, you know, mixed. Okay. kind of mixed. For methane, yes, because of the high salt marshes, okay, highly saline salt marshes. But uh, I, I let me come back to your question with a little bit more detail. That no no model is perfect, right? So no model is perfect. So we have seen that we can explain with the carbon dioxide model 70% variation in the data. That means 30% are not being explained. Okay, and in modeling literature, 70% is considered, natural science and engineering is considered pretty good, okay? But in, if you go to social science, and I am familiar with those, or medical literature, like public health, 20% is considered good, okay? So because that's so much difficult to capture, okay? So, so in those 30%, yes, we will not do a great job in predicting those, okay? And those are, uh, happen to be most of the time extreme values, okay? Either extremely low or extremely high. But again, we are mixing data from mid-Atlantic 26 sites, different species, different environmental condition. So I cannot tell you that all the data will be predicted exactly, okay? Most of the data should be predicted, should be. If it doesn't, let me know, okay? So go ahead. Yes. I have a question about um, on the on the sheet. Can you go back to the spreadsheet? Yes, of it's course. A about units. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so in the uh, yellow box on the output is the net CO two uptake. Yeah. Emissions. So it says net CO two uptake, but the units say grams of carbon per meter squared. And so we're we talking about C or CO two. No, uh, th thank you for asking that. We spent a lot of time carbon, C. We converted it by molecular weights. You converted it to CO2? No, we converted it to C. You converted it to C. C. Okay. To standardize it, because we have to subtract methane too. So therefore, you want, to, you want the units to be the same, and that's carbon. So you have to divide it by the molecular weight of carbon dioxide and multiply it by the molecular weight of carbon. So this is how I think uh, you have to stop me when I should stop. <laughs> I have that. <laughs> uh, I had a question about the um, time period for the model. Oh, right here. OK, I was looking for you. Um, Happy. Um, I, kept. I was wondering about the time period for the model, and um, so in a place like uh, a marsh in the northeast, you suggested 183 days, and I was um, curious about whether you would consider forecasting over a year, and whether that would change your estimate for potential sequestration for that wetland. For instance, if in the spring and the fall, you might have a burst of decomposition. So how that might um, be important to consider in the future uh, if, if you wanted to really value those wetlands accurately. <laughs> yeah, to answer the first question that if I can expand it to the whole year, okay. Definitely, if we put 365, it's going to overestimate the uh, net atmospheric car potential carbon storage in the wetland, okay? Uh, but in terms of coming to your second question, if you can do that, because this is, the Excel spreadsheet is open, 
okay the assumption is that it's equally product, predict, productive the salt marshes are productive equally uh, all seasons if that's the assumption and you have to mention that and that way everybody knows that you are actually over overestimating okay so you are more conservative to to determine the amount of storage that you can have maximum storage okay and with climate change it's not uh, uh, you know after 30 40 50 years you don't know whether uh, our winter here winter winter length of winter you will be happy about it you know might reduce in 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 the in the next 30 to 40 years okay uh, so in that case, if you are you know, doing an analysis, thinking about restoration or scenario into next 50 years, it may not be a bad assumption, okay? Like in extending the growing season, okay? Now, you, your second question was uh, whether uh, spring, uh, around springtime, and you mentioned another uh, season, but let's talk about springtime, there is a burst of decomposition because of you know, temperature increasing, and uh, I think you know some sort of dormant activity in microbial community, so it might find all of a sudden favorable temperature. It's like the tree leaves comes crazy as soon as possible. So once the winter is gone, I think you know we don't have that mechanism, that kind of particular mechanism in the model, explicitly directly, but indirectly it is there because soil temperature would be higher in that case, right? and light will be favorable, and salinity would be an input to the model, okay? Now, you talk, spoke about decomposition. Now, net uptake, uh, carbon dioxide uptake has also decomposition component because it is, it is not like we separated respiration versus uh, gross primary productivity. We took net uh, carbon dioxide uptake during the daytime, we modeled it, net carbon dioxide emission during the nighttime. There are, of course, no productivity during nighttime. That we model in terms of temperature. So temperature should reflect that, okay? That's, that's the assumption. If it doesn't reflect that kind of high productivity or decomposition period, then, uh, you know, model would probably either underpredict or overpredict. We have to see those. You know, this is something to test, okay? Thank you. Um, one, I saw a hand back there. Hi, Linda Deegan from the Woods Hole Research Center. Um, this is a lovely model. Um, I think Thank we're you. all looking forward to you know, being able to apply it. I do uh, want to sort of follow up on what Kathy said, and that is one of the things that we do understand is this kind of model, because it's focused on growing season phenomena, right. sort of assumes uh, it's not a one to one, but there's a balance that the microbes are working and the plants are working. And opposite things and the net is X. But one of the things that we learned is uh, in both salt marshes and it certainly is true in Arctic tundra where a lot of these things are happening is that the microbes start up sooner in the spring and they keep going longer in the fall than the plants. Mm -hmm. And we don't really have a ton of information on that but since blue carbon storage is the balance of what the plants do and what the microbes do, I think the next iteration is going to have to be some sort of model that accounts for that asymmetry. And in the TIDE project in Plum Island that you've heard some work on, um, we suspect that the nitrate that we were adding was continuing to stimulate microbial decomposition long after the plants senesce, right? And your model sort of stops when the plants senesce. And I think that's the, it's the right place to start this kind of model, but I think the next generation has to look at that asymmetry of plant production and microbial decomposition. Uh, I, I, thank you for asking this question. Model stops when you limit, like 183 by that, okay? But what you're telling me, and this is a good idea, thank you for that, it's like, there should not be just one day, one a fixed period for all components of the model. Uh, di, uh, li, Linda, right? Am I correct? So Linda, so there are three components of the model. One is uh, uh, carbon dioxide net uptake, and that can stop 
what you are saying, that can stop earlier, okay? Uh, because uh, earlier than uh, net respiration, because net respiration continues because of microbial activities, okay? So what you're suggesting that there should be, you know, three different uh, duration, at least two different duration. One for productivity, like yearly duration, like period, two, two different period, one for respiration. And I have to think about it further because carbon dioxide uptake had, has also respiration component. So I cannot just turn one off and uh, we have to think about it. It's, it's not going to be difficult, I think. Uh, but in a mechanistic model, definitely you can describe all of those. The problem with that, even you describe those, you still do not come up with a better prediction. <laughs> Actually, most of the time, worse prediction because of too many parameters and uncertainty. You cannot really you know, constrain it very well. Okay. Right, one more, one last one, and then we break. Um, so I was just curious. So we did take some data throughout all the seasons for yeah. the Koi model. Right. Is that data still in there? Yes. Okay. I don't know if that helps at all, but so there is data in the model past this growing season. Yeah. So yeah. It might. It might lend itself to that. She, she raised a very good point, and by the way, how are you? <laughs> so she said that the model is fitted already with those seasonal data. And uh, we have data from May, uh, I think some April, I don't know. Jim Tang, uh, are you here? Yes, we, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> and, uh, but so far I remember it's mostly uh, May to October, but maybe beyond that, a little bit beyond that, because it's hard to sample during winter too. So, so, but what hard logic is that we may have trained our model with data of those seasons. Okay. Now the question is, should it be 183 or more? <laughs> and that's just you know, it's not even part of the main model. It's something that we input and we kept it flexible. Because we, I, 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 honestly, I don't know for sure which would be the, you know, total period. Okay. Kevin, Kevin has raised his hand. We cannot ignore him. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good topic, and, and I just wonder if one way around this uh, would be to have another uh, aspect of user data input, which is what's the growing season. Your weapon. You know, what's, when, do, when does productivity start and stop for the plants? Then you could have a model that goes year round for respiration. The temperature would naturally make that stop essentially in the winter time at the appropriate time. Um, but you wouldn't be trying to model productivity when you know that vegetation is a nest. Yeah, I think. Thank you. I know that, it, what we have, I tell you the good news. You know, I mean, when we do science, we give a mixed message, and then I, I like it, because you want to be factual, and now you don't want to convince anybody. You want to give the facts, let the people decide, okay? But what Kevin said that uh, it's basically you just extend the uh, period of uh, respiration during a year, that's it. And for that, you have to know inputs from other people. That what do you think? Okay. So yeah. But as you play more with this model, I told you this is a parallel model and interactive. There are three terms. It interacts with each other. One goes less, another goes high. The product is probably beyond the threshold for productivity. Okay. So you might be surprised to see your out output. Okay. I was so. Play with this. Sorry, I just have one little uh, other comment slash question, which has to do with the PAR data. And when you sample in your marsh, do you want it to be on a sunny day, or do you want to try to get a good representation of cloudy to sunny days? And also, just so people are aware, there is a calculator online called this Clear Skies Calculator. And they'll give you PAR data in the units that you want. And it's based on your um, lat latitude and longitude. However, it's based on a sunny day. So I guess that is why I'm asking. 
but sunny day, if you use sunny day, you will end up with high productivity, okay? High net atmospheric carbon removal, okay? And that will bring a lot of smile in a lot of people who are restoring it. <laughs> but to be more factual, you want to mix it. You want to mix, as I said, three samples at all. I mean, I, I should say, should not at least, at least one, but uh, preferably three. Cloudy, sunny, maybe middle of the road. So then you can probably get more representative. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Omar and Mohammed. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.